So we're very pleased today, after several uh, attempts, to welcome Raghu Pasapathy here to our seminar series. Um, I give a lot of talks at conferences where Raghu is in the room, and Raghu will always politely wait until the end of the talk, and then in the most polite way possible say, I don't believe anything you just said. Um, and that's because Raghu is one of the most deep and creative thinkers in the simulation world. He thinks through things very carefully. He turns problems different ways and inside out. And the result is often a lot of very deep insight. He also has amazingly good handwriting. If you want to see an example of that, all of his STAT 420 time series lectures are professionally recorded. I've been watching them. Um, and it really is a masterful job. I'm sorry we can't have you do this lecture on the chalkboard today, Raghu. I think that that would be a great treat. Um, and today he's going to talk to us in a topic in simulation output analysis. Raghu? Thank you, Barry. Uh, I think I should just stop now because I don't know how I'm going to be able to match everything that you've just said. From here on, it's just going to go downhill. <laughs> But in any case, uh, so should I, how should we do this? Uh, am I able to share my screen? Is that, okay, perfect. Okay, so I hope you're able to see my screen here. Uh, my name again is Raghu Pasupati. I'm in uh, the Department of Statistics at Purdue. Uh, my talk for today is titled Inference on Statistical Functionals. Let me first thank my co-authors, Peter Glynn at Stanford University, Ying Che Ye at National Central University, Taiwan, and my current PhD student, Ziwe Su in the Department of Statistics at Purdue. I will talk about inference on statistical functionals. Um, I will say a little more about what these words, various words mean, but very simply, I'm going to talk about constructing confidence intervals and hypothesis testing in contexts that are different from the more traditional classical statistical contexts where the hypothesis tests are conducted or stated in a very simple way, things like, mu is equal to a constant sort of a thing, right? So those have traditionally been the way by which these things have been constructed. But as you, uh, if you're like me and you've, if you've been watching the recent developments in statistics and computer science, I see this as an age where we are, we are trading off uh, computation with analytical tractability, quote unquote. So in, the, in early times, in the time of Rao, for example, much of statistics was around building simple models so that one can do inference easily. And now I think that's been given away because we are able to do more computation. And what I'm going to say today, I think is going to be a very, very simple idea, uh, but with a lot, hopefully with a lot of reach where we can actually construct confidence intervals and do hypothesis testing in more complicated contexts. So hopefully that'll come through. So let us start very simply. Uh, all of us actually know the simple case of constructing confidence intervals on the mean. So let's take the simplest situation where we have IID statistics. So uh, we have IID random variables, x1, x2, x3, and so on. Let's assume for the moment that they're all normally distributed with mean mu and variance sigma square. And we do the usual thing where you know, on a basic class in statistics, we would have learned that if you are uh, shifting and then scaling this random variable, so x bar minus mu divided by sigma over root n is distributed as a standard normal, right? So we learned this from a first class in statistics. And as soon as we see this, we construct what is called 100 times one minus alpha percent confidence interval. So we just move, we, we take X bar and then we, we construct, we essentially add and subtract a quantity that we've all seen many, many times. And in order to construct a one minus alpha over two standard norm, Z alpha over two basically is a one minus alpha over two quantile of the standard norm, right? So this is the 100 times one minus alpha percent confidence interval. We all know this very, really, really well. 
Now, this is the context where sigma is known, right? So because we are going to construct this confidence interval, the, typically in basic statistics books, we'll see that say, this is the sigma known context. Soon after, in the early 1900s, I think, came along. Uh, let's see how I can advance the screen here. Hmm, interesting. Okay, that's better. Okay, so in this context, in a situation where sigma is actually not known, uh, we, we come to the context of uh, student T statistics, right? So very famously, William Gossett, one of my most favorite researchers, particularly because he navigated uh, complex situations with uh, Carl Pearson and uh, Fisher at the same time. He, uh, he you know, consider a very similar context where you have X1, X2, X3, and so on until Xn, IID normally distributed with mean mu and variance sigma square. But in this case, sigma square is not known. And so while constructing these confidence intervals, he noticed that sigma cannot be, uh, sigma is not known, but it can be estimated through the usual sample variance and then constructed what is now called, famously called the student T statistic, right? So you actually do exactly the same as what you do before, except that instead of plugging in sigma, you plug in a sigma hat, right? And you construct the corresponding confidence intervals, except that now instead of having a Z score, you have something called uh, um, the quantiles associated with the new distribution called the student T distribution. All of this is really, really well known to all of us. But let me actually you know, point your attention to a couple of things. In order to construct confidence intervals of this sort, three things need to happen. One, you need an estimate of the mean, which is X bar. You need an estimate of what I'm going to loosely call the variance associated with whatever context you're situated in. So in this case, an estimate of that variance, estimate of the square root of the variance is what is called sigma hat. And then there is this quantity in this case, in the, in the T statistic case, it is this quantity, which is the student T corresponding to the quantile of some distribution. So in the first case, it was a normal distribution. In the second case, it is a student T distribution. So these three quantities appear to be really crucial and they're gonna be carried through all over in our talk. Okay, so now let's ask the next obvious question. The, the question in both of these contexts is estimation of the population mean. The first context sigma was known, second context sigma was not known, but we were going after the mean, after the population mean. Now we ask the question, can we actually do this in a slightly more complicated context, a more modern quant context, quote unquote. Specifically, let's suppose that you're performing something like optimization, or quantile estimation or gradient estimation using a data set, as has now become really, really popular and famous. Is there an analog of the student's T? Now this, this question, at least uh, there is a folklore idea that, is, that has been prevalent in the simulation community for a very long time. It comes, goes under the name micro macro. So it's very, very popular among simulationists. And here's how it goes, it's a very intuitive idea. So let's take a particular context so that we have uh, some intuition to go with. Let's suppose that we are going to do optimization, right? So let's say deep learning. So parameter estimation for a deep learning model. So we have a really large data set. And what we are going to do is the following. Just like in the mean case, we actually had a bunch of observations. What we're going to do is we're going to take the entire data set and break it into batches. So in this particular picture, I have batch one, batch two, batch three, and so on. So with the first batch, I do whatever I would do with the big batch. So in other words, if I'm doing optimization, I do optimization with the first batch. So I use this as a data set, as an individual data set, do my optimization, get my parameters, quote unquote. That is what I'm calling a batch estimate, in this case, Y1. I do the same with the second batch, same with the third batch, same with the fourth batch and so on. So now what is happening is that these Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4 are in essence standing in for X1, X2, X3, X4 in the previous context. And thereafter, 
any inference that I want to do about the quantities that these Ys are estimating, I can treat them as individual observations on that quantity, and I can do statistics like I would do them in the, in the regular uh, uh, IID case or in the student T case, right? This is it, this is the essential idea. So the questions that we are going to ask is in this general context. Okay, so maybe I should stop right here to make sure that we are all on the same page because the idea doesn't, the, the broad idea doesn't go much deeper than this. Much of what I'm going to say hereafter is I'm going to formalize this and make this whole thing a little more precise. Okay. So let's move on. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, make this a little more formal. So I said, okay, we're going to do optimization or quantile estimation or gradient estimation. So the first obvious question that one should ask is, if I'm going to treat this in all generality as opposed to just mean estimation, in order to actually cover all of these contexts in one sweep, what is the correct mathematical object on which we should be considering confidence intervals, right? That's the first obvious question that one should ask. The second question that one should ask is what is the precise characterization of the student T in the, in the, in the more general context? So in other words, what is, the, uh, what is the analog of the student T so as to construct confidence intervals? Number three, do these batches that I showed you earlier do they necessarily have to be uh, non-overlapping or can I actually overlap them, right? So uh, it turns out the answer is yes, you can overlap them. And the fourth question is, can we allow dependent data? Here again, the answer is yes, and I'm going to formalize them going forward. Again, feel free to stop me and ask a question. Okay, so I'm going to argue, at least the early part of this talk, that the correct mathematical object that should be used to generalize the context of the population mean, it is what is called a statistical functional. The word functional comes from functional analysis. It simply refers to a real valued operator. But for everything that I'm going to say today, just think of a statistical functional as a, uh, as a functional that, that, that is essentially acting on a distribution to give you a real value. So think of theta as acting on a distribution to give some real number. Okay, so now I think this is best thought of in terms of examples. So let's go through a bunch of examples to make sure that we are, we are on the same page as far as this is concerned. Let's take the first non-trivial example. Let's take quantile estimation. So let us suppose that uppercase S is some random object. I call it a random object uh, because it's not necessarily a real, not necessarily real value. Okay, it's some random variable living in some space. And I pass it through some real valued function called G. So G of, X, G of S is some real valued random variable. And I'm looking for the quantile, the one minus gamma quantile associated with this random variable and I have a probability measure associated with it. So we write the quantile of that guy in the usual way, the smallest y, such that the probability of this guy is greater than or equal to one minus gamma. So this is the usual quantile estimation problem, right? And that turns out to be a statistical functional, right? It, it is subsumed by this notion of a statistical functional. Notice here again, that there is some underlying distribution that is governing all of this calculation. So I can think of this in generality. Once you give me this measure P, and once you give me this uh, real value function G, I can calculate in principle this quantile. Another really nice example of a statistical function is gradient estimation. So think of a situation where I have a real value function G, I'm sitting at a point X and I'm looking along the direction U. So I'm, I'm attempting to calculate the directional derivative at the point X along the direction U, that is formally written this way, right? That turns out to be a statistical functional as well. So once you give me the probability measure that is driving this expectation, I can compute in principle this directional derivative. 
My favorite example is optimization. If I want to find the minimum value achieved by some expectation that is defined over some space that I'm calling script X. And let's suppose that that integral is driven by this probability measure P. That turns out to be a statistical functional as well. The root finding is another example. A very recent example is CVAR estimation where you're trying to compute the expectation on the tail of some distribution. So to the right of some quantile, that is a statistical function as well. So all of these, I mean, if you go into more traditional statistics, the examples are endless, variance, trimmed mean, k-means clustering, simplical depth, it just goes on and on and on. All of these come under this purview of what I'm calling statistical functionals. Okay, so all through in the talk that follows the mu, which is the example in the first two slides that I gave, is going to be replaced by theta of p, right? And also remember what I said, uh, in constructing these confidence intervals, three things are gonna be important. One is what is going to estimate mu x bar in the first case, estimated mu. Then there was uh, an estimator of sigma, sigma square or sigma, sigma hat stood in for it. And then we had something associated with the quantile that was constructed, that was uh, used to construct the confidence intervals. We have a similar situation here. I need to think about what is going to estimate theta of P. And so that's what we'll talk about next. So let me state this problem statement in a, in a little more, a little more formally so that we are on the same page. So loosely, I want to construct confidence intervals on a statistical functional given data from discrete, some discrete time stationary stochastic process. This stochastic process need not be real value, but that's just a detail. Okay, so we, are, we have decided that we are going to go after some theta of P using this data that I'm, that I'm going to observe. And formally, we, are going to, we can state it the following way. Xn is a discrete time stationary S-valued stochastic process. Theta of P is a statistical functional associated with the measure P. And we are looking to construct confidence interval by observing this data. All through this talk, there are three classes of estimators that underlie these talk. The first one is, the, or is what is called the overlapping section estimator. This in turn produces two types of statistics. One is called the Z statistics. The second is called the SWAGS T1 statistics. I'll explain this in just a little bit. We'll go into some detail on this guy. The second very closely related is what is called overlapping batch. This in turn also produces two types of statistics which can be used to construct confidence intervals. And third one is a standardized time series, analogously producing two types of statistics. We won't go into the details on the third one. Hey, Raghu. Yes, Barry. Um, if you're gonna do it later, then don't answer the question, but I'd like to, I'm interested in what the X process that you batched corresponds to in the optimization case. Ah, let's actually, let me actually answer that question now because I'm certain that other people are thinking about this as well. So, um, so let's just take the context of uh, stochastic optimization where you're doing parameter estimation using a very large data set. So what you then do is you, let's say you take a data set of size N you divide it into sub data sets, each of which is a size little m. And you use each of these sub data sets to go ahead and construct parameter estimates. So you do optimization on that smaller data set. And the parameter estimate that you get from the first data set is what is called y1, y2, and so on. So think maximum likelihood estimation. When you're doing maximum likelihood estimation, the individual data sets will themselves produce parameter estimates, quote unquote. Yeah, now I, now I understand what you mean. I was thinking more like optimization over structural parameters, numbers of servers and things like that. That was, oh. so, so now I understand the context, that's fine. Right, okay. So uh, if you're optimizing over the number of servers, again, there's nothing in this picture that connotes the decision variable. Right, so right. everything is relating to the data that goes into the optimization problem. That was exactly the question I had, thanks. Great. All right, so let's move on. 
so I have to say, what is the analog of X bar in the context of estimating statistical functionals? The, the analog of X bar is the obvious one. The obvious analog of X bar is simply you take the unknown probability measure P and you replace it with what is known, which is the empirical measure Pn. So you construct the empirical measure P sub n using the data that you have, and then you plug it in for P. So you let Pn stand in for P and Pn goes into your theta and you do whatever you do to actually estimate your theta of Pn. So in, in a lot of cases, this, again, if you're, if you're not very familiar with this way of thinking, you might think you're going to explicitly calculate this empirical measure, but you're not. This is all just in principle, okay? So you're just going to plug in the empirical distribution or your empirical CDF to construct whatever you want to construct to get your estimator of theta of P. And this is going to form the centering variable around which you're going to construct your confidence interval. All right, so once you see this, then the idea becomes very easy and simple. So, but, but then let me just outline this to you over again, just so that we are on the same page. So I take this entire batch of entire data set. I divide these into batches. So in this picture, the first batch goes from observation one to observation M sub N. For generality, I'm not going to overlap these batches fully, but I'm going to start my second batch at the location DN plus one. Okay, so there's only so much that is overlapping. We'll come to this detail a little later. So the second batch starts at dn plus one. And because the batch itself is of size mn, it ends at dn plus mn and so on, right? No big deal. Of course, now, as soon as I do this, I can construct my empirical measure associated with the first batch, plug it inside theta. And that gives me my first batch estimator that I'm calling theta of pj comma n. I'm going to carry through my uh, data set size n because I'm going to send this little n off to infinity later, right? And this is the jth, this is the quantity that I get from the jth batch. And there are bn sub batches, okay? So I have all of these observations that are going to stand in for my x1, x2 that came up in my first slide. Once I have all of these objects, I do the usual thing. I construct an estimate of the sample variance. So this is my grand estimator, quote unquote. My grand estimator, again, to go back to the optimization example, I use the entire data set, construct my parameters. And I have the individual parameters constructed from the, each of the individual batches. I take this uh, you know, deviation, the squared deviation, and I take the average. And that is going to stand in for my sample variance. But I'm going to blow this up by a factor m sub n. m sub n is the batch size. And you can actually at least intuitively see why I need to blow this up by a factor m sub n. Because whenever I'm going to average by batch, I'm going to get I'm averaging a little bit. So I'm really, instead of getting the square root of N type statistics, I'm really getting square root of N divided by MN type statistics. So I have to blow it back up in order to get what I want. Once I get what stands in for the sample variance or a uh, sigma hat square, I just do what I do usually to construct my student T statistic. So what you see here, it is best to think of this by analogy, so what is standing in for theta of Pn here is X bar. I'm sorry, the other way around. What is standing in for X bar is theta of Pn. What is standing in for mu is theta of P. I blow it up by a factor square root of N, which is the data set size. And what is in the bottom is the scaled chi-square uh, square root quantity, or the other way of thinking about this is square root of sigma hat square. So this is precisely analogous to the student T. Once you have this, you construct your confidence intervals in the usual way. You center it around the quantity that you're going to estimate, plus or minus. So I told you again, right in the beginning that there are three quantities that are of interest that's good, that are going to play a role. The analog of X bar, the analog of sigma hat, 
divided by root n and the analog of the student t, the uh, critical value. So these three quantities show up all over again in the general context as well. So this is the broad idea. This, again, we are in intuitive land still, right? I mean, we have to actually formalize this very carefully and we have to think about where each of these things are going to go as I send n off to infinity so that I can make some concrete claims about the validity of these confidence elements. Okay, so uh, the obvious question then is from here on going forward in the rest of the talk, we are going to focus almost fully on the behavior of this statistic as the batch sizes and the total data set size goes off to infinity. In particular, I'm going to talk about how this quantity or this random variable is going to behave. And I'm going to give the secret out right away. This is going to converge to a very particular type of distribution depending upon how MN is going to behave or the batch size is going to behave. We're going to give it a particular name and we're going to be able to construct quantiles associated with that distribution. That's it, that's, uh, that's really it at some level. So here again, let me stop to see if there are questions before I move forward. Because hereafter, it's going to be much, a lot of analysis, quote unquote. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Yeah. So Regu, I'm gonna ask the, right, you, if theta of PN is too expensive, can I just average the theta PJNs? Yes, uh, great question. So you can do two things. One is a, you can average the theta JPN. In fact, that's, a, that's precisely the second estimator that we'll talk about. This is called the SWAGS T2 statistic. Uh, but I know, Dave, that you're probably thinking about optimization. Um, and in that situation, you could even because the typical optimization context I've seen is you usually have this grand estimator as well, right? So you don't really get all the computational advantage of using small batches because you have anyway computed theta of PN. So the other thing that I typically do in the optimization context is you don't even have to overlap these batches. You can use just a few of these batches without actually fully overlapping them, just compute a few of them. That's the other way to actually gain economy in computation. So those are two things that one can do. Thanks. I have two quick questions. So one is uh, in estimating the variance, why are you using in um, equation one? So could you have used the estimator from the batch instead of the grand estimator of theta PN? So that's question number one. Why didn't you use the batch estimator? Like the average so, can, of theta PJN. So can, can you, um, can you, I'm not sure that I'm following. So are you talking about this guy right here? Yes, theta so, of so the, one? the estimation of the variance, the one on the left. So the one on the, ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. So why are you uh -huh. using the grand estimator? Why don't you use the estimator that you have from the batch? So for example, the, oh sample uh -huh. average of all those theta PJN. Why don't you use that? So that's question number one. And uh -huh. to come up with the lambda um, critical values. So did you mention that you're gonna go after the distribution of the variance and come up with those quantile information from that distribution or? Yes, precisely. That's, okay. that's going to be the rest of the talk. We are gonna talk in detail about how this guy behaves so that we can construct quantiles from that distribution. Okay. So how, okay. how about and the first, the, the first one that I? Um... Yeah. So there are two answers to that question. The first answer, the the more direct answer, is that it turns out that theta p n is a better estimator than the average of the batches because you're using a larger data set, data size, quote unquote. So uh, this turns out, it turns out, is a better estimator than simply using the average of the batch estimators. But you could use the average of the batch estimators as well. This goes to Dave's question. And that's, that is the second estimator that I will be presenting. So instead of using the grand estimator, if you use theta bar of these guys, that gives you a slightly different limit of this. Uh, and one can use that as well. 
Thank you. So, uh, Raghu, I have a question. Yes. Yeah. So, if your batches come from uh, bootstrap, bootstrap sampling, ah. uh -huh. does it uh -huh. does your methodology apply to that? And does the usual bootstrap in confidence interval better or worse than what you are constructing for? Let's say just for the mean. Okay, so can you can you actually say more specifically how you are going to bootstrap? Because the detail, that detail is important. So if I just use the usual sampling with replacement. Uh huh. So and you're using sampling with replacement. Ah, I see. I see. Um, no, this uh, this theory will not hold good there. No, it will not go through. So whatever I'm going to say going forward will not apply to the bootstrap. I mean, it would be interesting to kind of investigate how to extend this to bootstrap of with different modes of sampling and so on. Yeah, I almost certainly, yeah, I think so. I have not thought about it. That's a good okay. question. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Now you're okay. basically yeah. looking at mean like parameter. And so that's why you have interval like estimate plus or minus something. If you have other kinds of parameters like scale parameters, for example, then the intervals no. are not of that type. No, so, so are you talking about, the, so theta of PN doesn't have to be a mean like parameter. I understand, right. So, right. So uh, theta of PN, for example, can be quantiles or, or, or optimizers or things like that. Uh, but we are constructing confidence intervals. And so, so clearly something that is, I, I've not told you what exactly this quantity is going to converge to, but in just the next slide, it's going to become very clear as to what sigma is in the context of statistical functional. So that's going to become really clear in a moment. Okay, so uh, let's go forward. So I'm going to I'm going to state five assumptions that are going to be really important going forward. The first four are what I call standing assumptions. So because we don't have the context of a mean, we need some assumption associated with the CLT in order for all of our theorems to go through. So the first assumption is a CLT. So uh, the grand estimator that we call theta of Pn minus theta of P scaled appropriately by root n has to converge to a standard normal. That's the CLT. So if you have a particular context, you have to prove it on a case-by-case -case basis. So for example, if you're doing quantile estimation or if you're doing optimization or if you're doing gradient estimation, in each of these contexts, you have to assure yourself that such a CLT holds. In virtually every context that we have taken up thus far, this tends to hold. The second quantity I think is, uh, is related to what you were asking, Professor Tamhane. I think this is, the, this is the second part. We have to define what sigma square is. And this is often in the general context is what is called the time average variance constant. Formally, we define it this way. So theta of p n minus theta of p square, it's actually much easier to take this n on the inside and write this as root n times theta p n minus theta p square. So if you write it this way, you can associate it with this guy. So it's a scaled deviation square in expectation. Whatever that limit converges to, that's what I'm going to call sigma square. And that's going to play a starring role in all my confidence interval construction. Okay, so that's going to be, so the, that's called the TAVC or time average variance constant. We have to assume stationarity again, stationarity and strong mixing allow us to actually introduce dependence. So everything that I'm going to say going forward will apply even for dependent data and A3 and A4 are going to do much of the heavy lifting as far as, as, far as in incorporating dependence is concerned. So hopefully these four assumptions are really clear. These four assumptions together are, pro are going to produce what are called Z statistics. So if we just assume these four and if we assume if we make sure that the batch sizes that we are using 
are going to infinity while remaining small with respect to the total data set size, we are going to end up estimating sigma square consistently. And that's what I'm going to call Z statistics. In a situation where you use large batches, so large that they are not small compared to the total data set size, you have a very different type of limiting structure. And it's going to produce a limiting structure that I'm going to call swag statistics. And in order to actually characterize the limiting structure, that limiting structure, these four assumptions are not sufficient because we actually, the dependence between batches becomes very, very large. And you actually need to characterize them a little more finely. And that's done using what is called the strong invariance principle. Now, this is one of the most powerful assumptions that I've, well, I don't want to call it an assumption, but I want to spend just one minute on it because especially if you're a simulation person, this is really uh, incredibly useful assumption. And so let me spend just one minute on it. So let's think about the strong invariance principle for just a moment. So if you take the central limit theorem, the usual CLT, and you think about a stochastic process, SFT, the usual, C, usual CLT appears in a very general case like this, right? So you subtract off the mean, you scale it appropriately. And if upon scaling appropriately, it goes in distribution to the uh, standard normal, that's what you call a CLT. I've written this in generality. Notice that this, this limit is weak convergence. It's going in distribution. A slightly stronger assumption is what is called functional CLT. In functional CLT, what you do is, um, so again, if you're losing intuition here, think of the interpolated process, right? So think about Brownian motion. If you have a partial sum and you want to scale it a particular way, you construct the, the interpolated process and you have something like this, right? So for every fixed T, you parameterize by epsilon. So in the interpolated example for partial sums, N is standing for one over epsilon. So that is some scaling associated with the stochastic process. Here again, if you're losing intuition, just think of some scaling associated with the stochastic process, subtracted off appropriately and scaled appropriately. You're essentially constructed, constructing a scaled stochastic process and such a process then converts to Brownian motion. That is functional CLT. This by the way, should not have a tilde. So S epsilon, is converging to the Brownian motion. The difference between these two guys is the convergence here is, is real value. The convergence here is pathwise. So in other words, loosely speaking, these guys are located in path space. So the paths are what are converging weakly to the Brownian motion, right? So, and when I talk about converging weakly in Brownian motion, I have to think about in what sense are they converging? And so we need some sort of a topology. So we use the Skorohar topology typically and say that we converge in Brownian motion. But this convergence is still weak in the sense that this is only in distribution. So a simulation is typically whenever he or she sees such a convergence of the sort is very tempted to do the analysis on the Brownian motion itself, which of course is not possible because this is only weak convergence. What allows one to do such an analysis directly on the Brownian motion is what is called the strong approximation assumption. So basically in a lot of situations where you have a weak convergence of this sort, what you could do is you could actually go one step further and define these random objects in the same probability space so that you can compare them directly. And in particular, you can state a theorem of this sort. You can move these two random variables into the same probability space without changing the distribution of S epsilon so that you can compare Brownian motion and the underlying stochastic process to within some error. The advantage that this gives is that all of my analysis can be done on the Brownian motion. So for example, if you want to invoke things like the maximum of a Brownian motion, or if you want to do things like law of iterated logarithm on the Brownian on this process that you've constructed, you can do it on the Brownian motion to within this error. And that's what this gives you, uh, allows you to do. In our context, there's a lot of dependence across batches that's going to show up. So we are going to invoke or directly go to Brownian limit 
And then we are going to invoke the strong approximation to say that whatever deviates from Brownian motion is very small. And so the, the limit theorem is going to go through. So this is the power of strong approximation. So again, strong approximation is the strongest, typically it implies the functional CLT, which then implies CLT. Just to, just to make sure that we are on the same page. So loosely strong approximation allows the process of the Brownian motion for pathwise analysis. This started, this work started all the way in 1975 by work by Philip and Stout and thereafter by uh, Peter Glynn and Eigelhart, Don Eigelhart and it's this beautiful set of papers uh, during that time. So let me get out of this aside and let me go back to our main, main results. Okay, so in the following slides will be the crux of the main theorems that I will present. Like I said earlier, all of our results fall in two broad categories. One is a small batch and the large batch category. So this picture should guide your thinking. So in the first situation, the batch size goes to infinity, but the batch size is small compared to the total data set size. In such a case, we get what are called Z statistics. And in the other situation where MN goes to infinity and N also of course goes to infinity, but MN is of some of, is of the same order as N. So MN over N goes to beta one, which lies in the, in, in the open interval zero to one, right? When this happens, you, you don't get consistent statistics, but instead it goes to a completely different distribution. So let me state this again more formally. Here again, we are leading up to the theorem. So I, I still want to give you more intuition. So this again is a synopsis of the results. So think back about V sub N. V sub N, what is V sub N? Sigma hat square, so right here. V sub N is standing in for sigma hat square and TN is standing in for the student T. So in a situation where we have small batches it turns out that V sub N goes to sigma square in probability. So we get a strong estimation of sigma square. And you can actually sense why this is true. The batches are small. And so you have many of them. You have a lot of these batches, small batches, and the batch size itself is going off to infinity. So you can, in fact, even in the general case of the statistical functional demonstrate after a lot of mathematics that you do get consistent estimation. Because you converge in probability, you also converge in distribution. And when you look at the corresponding T statistic, of course, the numerator goes to a, a, Z, a Z distribution because we've assumed it. The denominator goes in probability to sigma square. And now we can use Slutsky's, we can invoke, invoke Slutsky's and then we get the Z statistic, no surprise. So much of the- can I, much of, can I get a question? Yes. Um, is there any condition on dn for, for this to hold too, the, the overlap variable dn? Yeah, so there is in fact no, um, the extent of the overlap doesn't play a role as far as the small batch statistics is concerned. The only thing that you need is that mn over n goes to zero, but mn goes to infinity. That's it. Okay, got it. thank you. Uh, and then, so this goes to the Z statistic. And uh, in the second case where there's large batches, you don't, get, you don't get consistent estimation. So sigma square is not estimated consistently. Instead, what happens to the analog of sigma, sigma square, which is sigma hat square, is that it goes to a random variable. It goes to sigma square times what I'm calling cap lambda. This cap lambda is a new random variable, quote unquote. It's the analog of the chi-square random variable. And so when you plug it in into the student T, here again, the numerator looks like a normal, the denominator looks like a scaled chi-square, and you end up getting a random variable that looks like this. I've not yet told you what cap lambda is, but I will, sh I will show this to you rigorously in the next slide. You get a limit that looks like this. This is what we are calling the swags T1 random variable. Swags T1 named appropriately is, is the analog of the T statistic. 
the the letters S W A G S stand for the uh, stand for Bruce W Schmeiser, James Wilson, Christos Alexopoulos, David Goldsman, and Lee Shrubin. These are the authors. I mean the 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 um, the literature associated with this corresponding random variable in the context of estimating steady state mean is 30 to 40 years old and it's very, very deep. Okay, so they discovered this random variable uh, and a lot is known about the uh, nature of this random variable, quote unquote. And one has to see this work as essentially an extension of that work into the context of statistical functions. So basically at some level we are saying, yeah, it's okay and we have identified this particular random variable and we can construct quantiles associated with this random variable so that we can correspondingly construct confidence intervals. And Raghu, numerator and denominator of that random variable are independent? Asymptotically independent. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, so now I'm going to say a little more about this random variable. I'm going to first state this formally in the form of theorems, and then we are going to talk just for a few minutes. I still have about 13 minutes, I, I see, so 10 minutes. So uh, we'll talk about these, this random variable. All right, so the, the Z statistics first. So in the context where MN or N goes to zero and the batch size goes to infinity, we get consistent statistics, Tn goes to normal. Now, there's one other little detail that one, one needs to think about here. Notice here that in Z statistics, we are actually estimating sigma square consistently, right? So we are actually, in, in order to co construct confidence intervals, it turns out you don't have to actually estimate sigma square strongly. You can cancel them out. They up, the sigma appears in both the numerator and the denominator. So strictly speaking, you don't have to estimate this consistently, but it turns out that when the number of batches is very large, you can do this. And when the batch size is large and then N over MN goes to infinity, you can actually do this. So that's a little detail. The way we prove this is by dividing batches dividing the entire data set into layers. What, what that means is the following. You have this big data set using observations. What you do is you divide, so let's take the situation where you have all these batches that are overlapping a lot. What you do is you break this down into batches, the layers of non-overlapping batches. So in the, in the first layer that you see here in black, you have one, two, three and four batches. Each of these batches is non-overlapping. The overlapping part, part is pushed to the next layer, quote unquote. And then the next guy who starts in the third point is pushed to the next layer and so on. And you analyze the statistic layer by layer because it has only non-overlapping batches. And because the number of such batches is very, very large, because N over MN goes to infinity, the result just goes through after invoking what is called the triangular weak law. This can be done a little more easily in the steady state mean estimation context, but the mathematics becomes a little, little harder in the statistical functional context, but it goes through. Now we come to the SWAGS T1 statistics. This in some sense is, uh, in my opinion, the most thrilling part. Because even in a situation where you don't estimate sigma square consistently, you get something interesting. Because Vn actually converges to sigma square times what I'm calling cap lambda. You can guess that cap lambda should look like the chi square and it precisely looks like that. So if you look at cap lambda, notice it is, so if you bear with me, let me actually take you back all the way back here. So if you loosely think about this random variable, this guy is looking like a squared normal and the number of batches Bn is going off to infinity. So this should look like an integral of squared normals. Squared normals after scaling is basically chi-square. So it should look like a chi-square being integrated out. That's precisely what you get here. So you have a Brownian motion this is standing in for the overlapping batches, subtracting off the Brownian motion observed at one, standing in for the grand estimator. 
You're subtracting this guy from this guy and squaring it. So this is standing in for chi square and you're integrating it out. And this beta one is, is a scaled batch size. So it's the blow up factor that you saw right in the beginning, the MN factor. So cap lambda converges to this random variable. And this is what we're calling cap. Uh, this is what we are calling cap lambda. Once you divide through here, in order to get such weak convergence, we invoke the strong law again, strong approximation again. That's really it. So it is very, very intuitive. Now the math, the algebra should be intuitive, but let me actually spend, because I'm running out of time, let me actually show you, show this to you in a picture to give you a little more intuition. What I've plotted here is the uh, cumulative distribution function associated with SWAGS T1. Okay, and what you're seeing is really the CDF and the positive orthant. So if you want a complete picture of the CDF, just reflect it off the y-axis and then again reflect it off the x-axis. So it's symmetric into the complete negative orthant. So I'm showing you only the positive orthant. So there are two envelopes. The lower envelope is basically the student T with degree of freedom equal to one. The upper envelope is student T with degree of freedom equal to infinity, which is a normal distribution. And all the way in the middle, you get what are called these swags T1 distribution. So, and the way it evolves is that as beta one, remember what beta one is, it's just the batch size that is scaled. As beta one increases, your MNs are increasing, your batch sizes are increasing. So this is beta one equals one half. This is beta one is equal to one tenth. So as the batch size is getting smaller and smaller, you're approaching the, the standard normal. As batch size is getting larger and larger, you're approaching the student T with de degree of freedom equal to one. To see why this is very, very important, let's take the 0.9 quantile, right? So if, for example, you did not have the SWAGS T1 distribution, but instead decided to approximate it with a, with a, with a standard normal, at 0.9, the quantile associated with the standard normal is somewhere around 1.3. While in reality, let's say you should have used something like 1.6. So you're about 20 to 30% off, and that's going to show up in your confidence intervals. So it can be quite, quite a difference if you end up using the wrong distribution. Okay, so I had a part two on, sequen uh, on what I call the sequential setting where, so let me just state it for one minute here and then we can quit. The sequential setting is a setting uh, which I think is particularly useful in the context where you're not doing such confidence interval estimation in one shot. You don't have a static data set and you're trying to construct a confidence interval, but instead you're observing this estimator as data is evolving, as data is coming in. And so think optimization yet again, you're running an optimization algorithm and you're constructing this estimator, you keep constructing a confidence interval on it. And then you want to stop when you think the confidence interval is, is short enough, quote unquote. So how can one do something like this? And so we introduce uh, a formal decision theoretic framework to do something of this sort where we have a quantity associated with the quality of the statistic and a quantity associated with the cost. And let us suppose that you want to stop. Uh, what is a stopping time that you should be using in order, to, in order to minimize the risk associated with the statistical functional? You can see how uh, or why this would be very important and how this is connected to the early part of the talk because this is all about constructing confidence intervals and making sure that they are short enough, but not too short that it interferes with the amount of costs that you're expending going through. So maybe in, uh, at another time, I will give you more details on this particular, uh, this particular problem. So I'll quit right there with some conclusions. Uh, in some ways, I feel that we appear to have reached a stage where computation is actively being traded off for increased generality in inference. Uh, recently, particularly, I've been seeing a lot of papers 
uh, in statistics where people are using non-standard hypothesis tests. So what I mean by that is, instead of using simple tests where, where you say mu is equal to some constant and you're doing hypothesis tests on it, you have more complicated hypothesis tests. And in order to actually construct test statistics on it, you have to do a lot of computation. So this appears to be the trend. And this makes a lot of sense. Uh, you're, you're actually trading off an analytical tractability with computation, I guess. And this, again, is in some sense, uh, is an example. We are, we are pushing into slightly more complicated situations where we could potentially do some inference. Z and SWAG statistics can be applied to inference, I think, in context much wider than the traditional steady state mean context. We have quantile tables and code for SWAGs T1 and SWAGs T2, something that I did not talk about, but several questions were raised in the stock. Can you actually replace state of PN with simply the average? That's exactly SWAGs T2. And you can actually see what the corresponding cap lambda will be in that case. Uh, but we have quantile tables for that. And we also have something called SWAGs T3, something that I did not talk about which is based upon standardized time series. I'll stop there, thank you. Uh, how difficult it is to compute the SWAT's T, T distribution and is it, does it make sense to approximate it by a T distribution with some degrees of freedom? Because you drew these curves and you know the mm. two limits are T with infinite degrees of freedom and T with one degree of freedom, which is the Cauchy distribution. So yes. does it make sense to approximated by a T with some estimated degrees of freedom? Uh, yes, uh, however, uh, we, have, we have two things. We've made some progress on inverting the Laplace associated with swag distributions. So we can actually compute these things fairly accurately now. I see. Okay. We also have Monte Carlo tables. So we don't yet see a need to approximate it using the student T, but we could. Okay. Raghu, I assume there have been some experiments to look at small sample behavior? Yes, uh, the experiments have been, have been very mixed thus far. So we've, been, we've had a lot of success in, of course, there's been 40 years of literature on steady state estimation, steady state mean estimation. That's a big success the simulation community, I think. We've had a lot of success with quantile estimation. Uh, we've had a lot of success with CVAR estimation. Uh, with optimization, we are, still, we, we are still not yet there, quote unquote. The difficulty we've been facing is that uh, the batch size, uh, the decision associated with how big the batch size should be or the constants is a very important factor. And it has to be done on a case by case, case basis, unfortunately. The constant that appears on the higher order bias terms, it turns out happens to do with a particular context and that needs to be done on a case by case basis, unfortunately. Other questions for Raghu? All right, um, well, thank you very much and uh, for giving the talk and some, here's some virtual applause. <laughs> thank you, thank you very, very much.